Welcome back to Approved Unto God. I'm Joshua Govitz. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 28. It's been quite a while, and uh, trying to get back in this, and uh, sometimes it's a struggle to get back in a groove of doing what you're used to doing. Uh, you know, things come up, and life happens, and sometimes it's hard to get back on track, and I pray that I can get back on track and start uh, getting more messages out to be heard, and I hope that they can be a blessing to you. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 28, and also uh, my mother, she's doing uh, quite a bit better. Um, she still has the occasional attack and anxiety, I think. Um, you know, just the medicines and different things that she's on, pain medicines and all that can really mess up your mind when, whenever uh, you, you, your next dosage is due and the effects start waning. They have uh, some sort of uh, effects that can cause anxiety and all that. So just pray for her. Pray that God would continue to use her and that she would just have the peace of the Lord. And everybody says that they come over to visit, that uh, they just really feel God's presence. And um, it's just a real blessing. And I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate my mother. She's blessed me and supported me my whole life and, and has been behind me. And... Uh, you know, I'd like to make her proud as her son and do a good job here representing the Word of God and Jesus Christ. Proverbs chapter number 28, verse number 6. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. And we're just going to go verse by verse and explain them. Uh, better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness. Most people don't believe that. They don't believe the Bible concerning that. They don't believe that being poor is a good thing or could possibly be categorized as a better thing than being rich. They think having things and having popularity and having money and having the nice house and having the nice vehicles, having the ski resort to go to, having all the popularity and the fame, they think that that is the epitome of life. But God says, better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. People could be rich, but then yet not know God, be contrary to God in their walk and talk, their life, their manner, uh, manner of living. And God says, this is the error. This is the error to think that it's better to be rich. And God said, no, I didn't come to call the, the, the righteous but sinners of repentance and the, the Pharisees had problems with who Jesus was sitting and eating with it was the poor it was uh, oftentimes it was also a mixture it was the rich too because the tax collectors he ate with them and they had money but ultimately it was those that were a poor spirit uh, not necessarily poor as in living in poverty but they're poor in spirit blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. God went after those poor, humble, lowly of heart people. Sometimes it was the dregs of society. Sometimes it was the rich people of society. But yet still, they were like pariahs. They were uh, hated. They were um, not popular in their day. Like Matthew, the tax collector. Sure, he had money. But he did not have, I, th I believe, the friendship of many a Jew. <laughs> many a Jew despised him because he stood with Rome where he should have stood with his own people. And they would probably spit on him and, and hate him for his choice to, to live that kind of life. It was an extravagant lifestyle. But there was also those that were poor and that just did not line up and did not... Uh, maybe have the, the proper sacrifices or they, they were poor and they offered up turtle doves instead of uh, the fancy the fancier uh, sheep sacrifices and these people were poor and they were despised and, but then yet they walked in their uprightness and God says this is what I'm after I'm after those that will walk in their uprightness and it's better to be poor and walk after your uprightness than to be perverse in your ways though you be rich Many of the Pharisees were very rich. Um, the, the high priest in that day had a mansion um, in Jesus' time. And, and they were rich, but yet they did not present themselves properly before God. They, they were hypocritical. 
They walked perversely. They knew what the Word of God says, but they did contrary to the Word of God. The Word of God teaches mercy, but yet they were very unmerciful to those that didn't meet the standard of the Word of God. Uh, you know, the, the objective here is to see that you're a sinner. The, the law is there so you can see I fall short of the glory of God and I cannot please God in my own efforts. I need his mercy. I need his grace. But the Pharisees, they were perverse in their ways and they thought they were keeping the law, but they really weren't. Uh, and, and they were not rich toward God, though they seemed to be rich and successful in life. They were perverse in their ways. Uh, God said, uh, and Jesus said that you you do well to, to do what the Pharisees teach you to do, but don't follow after their example because they're perverted in their living. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. And I've lived a life of relative poorness to my surroundings. I, I don't have a lot, but I have enough and I have Jesus Christ. But sometimes I think God wants us to have the fellowship of his poorness. You know, he had all the riches of heaven, but he left that behind and, and came here and lived a life that was impoverished. And he had not where to lay his head. The Son of Man didn't even have a place to lay his head as he did his three and a half year ministry. And I believe God would like us to go through a poorness that could help us to relate to those that are poor. Some, some of us were always lived in, rich, in riches. We've always had enough. We've always had more than enough. And we don't know how to relate to the poor. And God says, I want you to be able to reach a vast amount of men. Not just those that you grew up around. Not just those that can relate to you. But he wants to make you relatable to all men. And are you willing to be poor? Are you willing to suffer the loss of many things? so that you can have compassion on the poor and be used of God to reach more of a multitude of people. The problem is the poor oftentimes can't reach the rich and then the rich oftentimes can't reach the poor. This is the problem. You have a man that drives a vehicle that's kind of old and beat up and maybe got rust on it and you pull up a driveway, a long driveway that has uh, a gate and everything else assuming they let you even through the gate and then you tell them I got the word of God I have the truth of the gospel I want to present to you I want to tell you that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins and was buried and rose again from the dead on the third day and if you would if you would admit your guilt before God and that you're a sinner God can save you today you can have a relationship with God the Father and the person would look at your car and say well I'm fine <laughs> I think if anybody's in God's good graces, I am, because look what I have. I got this really nice house. I got this Lamborghini over here, and I got this uh, sh this Cadillac SUV over here, and you're driving this little old beat-up Chevy. Why would I want to listen to you if anybody's right with God? I am. And there's an error in that, and trusting in your riches. And uh, too often times, the rich will never receive the truth, especially from a poor person. And uh, they can't look past their poverty. They can't look past their poorness to receive the message of hope, the, the message of truth, because they think they already obtained the truth. They think, if anybody's right with God, I must be, and you must not be as right, of, right with God with me, because look what you got. Look what you drove here. Look at your clothes. Look at my clothes. Look at your clothes. And people can't get past the outward appearance, and that's a big problem. But, but here, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said, It is better that you're poor and you walk in your uprightness. What is that? Where do you learn uprightness? You learn it from God, from his word. You observe it in the scripture, and then you do it in God's strength. And, it, and it's better to be that way. It's better to live an upright life and not have much in this world, but be rich toward God and have riches laid up in heaven than to live a perverted lifestyle, a life that you might know the truth, but then you put your own twist on it, and that's perverting the truth. Uh, and, and 
you think you're right with God, you think just because of what you have that you're you're good. Well, I give a lot. I give to the poor. I give away much of what I possess, but yet you're trying to buy God off. And God says, that's not what I taught you. I don't receive that kind of gift. You know, or maybe maybe you're rich and you have so many things to give to God. You say, well, I'm going to give a big offering. And God says, I don't want your offering. What I want you to do is get right with your brother who you haven't talked to for three years. I don't want your riches. I'm not after your riches. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need it. What he wants is a right heart. He wants somebody to walk, even if they're poor, whether you're rich or poor, to walk in your uprightness and walk according to the word of God. He wants you to have your 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 fellowship and your friendships in order before he would take your riches and take your money. He doesn't need it. Of course he would want you not to be attached to things or to money, but not at the expense of uh, lost relationships. Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son. There's wisdom in keeping the word of God. Of course there is. But he that is a companion of righteous men shameth his father. You know, growing up, my dad, he would like me to have wise friends. And the friends that had good character, he could spot them right away. And the ones that lacked character, he judged them as not compatible for me, not, not very wise for me to walk with. And he would uh, be quite critical, and, and rightly so. These people are going to lead you down a wrong path, son. They're going to lead you into the jailhouse. They're going to lead you into drugs. And any father that loves their son is going to desire for their son to follow after wise men. Why don't you have wise friends? Why don't you get mentors in your life that can teach you wisdom, how to, how to manage your money, how to be a good worker, how to uh, be diligent in anything you do, how to be right with God, how to observe what the Lord has revealed through the scripture. This is what's going to make your father proud and your heavenly father especially proud. He wants you to be wise in this life. He does not want you to walk in this life blind to the truth of the word of God and, and its application in your life. Many walk after riches. Many walk after fame. Many walk after popularity and the wrong kind of friendships, but it, what does it get them in life? It gets them to shame their father, their earthly father, and their heavenly father with their decision making, the people they decide to surround themselves with. They live a life that's of ill repute. And though they have money, no true father is going to be proud of their son if they live a perverted lifestyle, no matter how much money they make. We want to please God and we want to walk in his ways. We want to walk in our uprightness. We want to be the companion of wise men. Many of us, we may not have a big circle of friends in our life, but what you could do in this internet day and age is surround yourself with the kind of preaching and the kind of men that preach the word of God in wisdom and live a life that is not of ill repute, not uh, and not 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 uh, desirous of vain glory or just riches and trying to get your money, but somebody that is going to teach you how to be humble and walk with your God really closely. I surround myself with these kind of men, and I'm thankful for them. I listen to Brother James Knox, and I've grown a lot through the years listening to his preaching for probably uh, on and off for over 20 years. But I was telling my friend, Brother Matt, that I probably listened to him consistently every single sermon, Sunday and Wednesday sermon, from uh, 2000, probably the end of 2013 or so, all the way till now, 2023. So nearly 10 years consistent. And that is a wise person to follow. I also listened to Brother Brent Logan for the past couple years, and I've learned a lot from him, another very wise man. I listen to Brother Zach Poonin, a man that teaches me a lot about humility and the fear of God and, and, and humbleness uh, and, and walking upright. And I listen to uh, a few others, and I'm not going to list them all, but surround yourself with wise people. Wise people are those that get that wisdom from God. We're not talking about 
the wise in this world. We're not talking about street smarts. We're talking about wisdom of God can only be had from God. If the persons you hang around with do not know God, then they do not have true wisdom. You need to avoid those kind of people. Mark them. Avoid them. Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of righteous men shameth his father. Look at Luke chapter number 15 and verse number 11. Luke 15 and verse 11. The prodigal son. And he said a certain man had two sons. This was Jesus speaking. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall up to me. And he divided unto them his living. Might as well pray. I don't think I prayed. Father, Lord, please bless your word. I pray, God, you speak through me and use me. Help me, Lord, to have clarity of thought and to uh, just really make clear what the word of God says. In Jesus' name, amen. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall up to me. And he divided unto them his living. So he got his inheritance early. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. Oftentimes, once you get what you want, even from your parents, you hit the road, don't you? And I know some examples of that. And I know a lot of fathers would say, yeah, I, that's the way it played out for me and my son or my daughter. And in there, wasted his substance with riotous living, especially young children or young adults, they don't know how to spend their substance. They don't have wisdom enough to avoid the pitfalls in life and the wrong kind of people and the wrong kind of living that will just empty your wallet very quickly. And I'm still learning this myself. Uh, you know, I nickel, nickel and dime myself to death sometimes with energy drinks and things like that. And not spending my money wisely. But here, this young man takes all the money that his inheritance allowed and he, he got it all before his father died and he wasted it and he wasted his substance on riotous living and I believe he was the companion of riotous men that taught him the wrong kind of way of living not what his father instilled in him and when he had spent all there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want and there's a lot of wisdom in saving your money and saving for a rainy day because sometimes they, they show up in life don't they and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed, to feed swine. So more than likely, he's around Gentile people, dealing with swine, and uh, he's away from his own people. And oftentimes, you find yourself, when you're the companion of riotous men, men that don't follow after the law or the word of God or don't walk uprightly, they will take you away from the church life, they will take you away from the Bible, and you will hang around with heathen riotous men and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him and he's in such a state that he wants to eat the the, the pig's food <laughs> when he had so much at his father's house and when he came to himself and that's what it takes Sometimes you need to hit rock bottom before you can wake up. And uh, I've been preaching to the men in the jail, in the Tuscola County Jail. And many of these men, this is going to be a great benefit to them to be in jail. So that way they can wake up. So that way they can see, look at what happened doing life my own way. Living life the way I please. Running with the wrong kind of crowd. It has brought me to poverty. It has brought me to naught. It has brought me to nothing. It has brought me to the worst of circumstances. I'm in a jail cell. And uh, hopefully that could be their wake-up call. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father, of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? Look at this riotous living where it's got me. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And before you ever get deliverance, you're going to have to realize that, that you've sinned against God. You're a sinner. You're a sinner before God. God is holy. God is righteous. And you need to be reconciled to your Father. You need to be forgiven of your sins. You need to go to Him to receive this forgiveness. And uh, He's not coming to get you and bail you out. And He not 
he is not necessarily going to bail you out of your circumstance. If you're in jail, when you find the Lord, you may remain in jail. Sometimes people remain in jail or, or they remain in prison their whole life after they get saved. But you can go to the Father. You can go to him for forgiveness. And uh, he's, not, he's not very far away. He's always there waiting and watching, waiting for you to return. He sets the table for you. And he loves you, and he wants you to come home. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. You know, those that approach God thinking that they're worthy of eternal life, they're going to be sent away very sadly, like the young rich ruler who thought he was worthy. He said, you know, I've kept all the law. I've done all this, this and that. And he starts stating it before Jesus Christ. And Jesus said that there's none good but God. So why are you calling yourself good? He said, why don't you sell everything that you own and come and follow after me and sell it all, give it to the poor. And he walked away sorrowfully for he had many good, many, many, uh, many riches, many good things. So he thought that he deserved heaven. He thought that he was worthy of heaven and no one is worthy. And this, uh, this prodigal son realized that. And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And that's the way it is. The beautiful uh, divide. Uh, once was a division, that divide is gone. And there's a beautiful, beautiful relationship restored. And there's, and there's fellowship with the Father. And if, if you're unsaved, there's never been a, any kind of relationship there. You cannot know God aside from Jesus Christ. And when you come to Jesus Christ, you can have your relationship mended with the Father. You can know the Father and the Son. Um, and if you're backslidden on God and you've gotten away from the Lord, you can have your uh, your walk, your... your uh, your relationship's already there, but the standing versus the state. Your your state that you're in is not very, uh, it's not suitable for fellowship with God. God says, I'm not going to walk with you while you walk in darkness. But if you would forsake this darkness, if you would confess the darkness that you're in and want to get right with me, then we can have a fellowship again. We can have a good closeness and a good walk, and you can have your prayers answered and all that. And we'll see that also in Proverbs. So let's turn back and uh, we'll, we'll hit pause here. Turn back to Proverbs chapter number 28. And uh, we'll move on. We'll look at verse number 8. He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance. Many do that. You know, many will get rich at the expense of the poor. And many a false preacher will do that. They'll uh, take the poor widow's money and um, use it to buy a jet airplane and really fancy cars and mansion houses and all this. But the Bible says he that by usury, and that's usury is, is interest, and unjust gain, increase of its substance. It, there's nothing wrong with interest, but to put 16 or 20 some percent or 30 percent interest on things, you're taking advantage of people. And, and God says, I will take that and gather it for him that will pity the poor. Let's read it again. He that by usury and unjust gain increases the substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. Oftentimes, somebody gets rich through crooked means, and then they die, and then they leave their inheritance maybe to their son, and then their son uses it and, and donates that money to the poor and blesses the poor with it. And God's got a way of making things work out uh, to, to the blessing of the less fortunate. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Shall be an abomination. You cannot walk in darkness and ignore God and his word and what he states in the word and say, I have fellowship with God and I walk in darkness and God is going to walk in the darkness with me. He will not. You will not have your prayers answered. That's why it's so important that we keep short accounts with God. When you sin, you ought to confess it right away and, and, and forsake it and receive mercy and have fellowship with God. Otherwise, 
when you're in the darkness, you do not have right to the throne room of God to have your prayers answered. God is not going to hear you. Look at John chapter number 15, verses 6 through 14. John chapter number 15. John 15, and 6 through 14. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. The key is abiding in Christ. You're walking in his strength. You're in the word of God. The words abide in you. You, you are thinking biblical thoughts. You're praying in a biblical way. You're speaking as thus saith the Lord, and you're, you're, you're being a witness as you're supposed to. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love, if ye keep my commandments. So there's a stipulation to it. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. But what if you're disobedient? Then you're not in his love. You're not abiding in him. So you're not getting your prayers answered. You don't have good fellowship with him. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. You want your joy, your joy to be full, you need to abide in God. You need to keep his commandments. You need to walk as Jesus Christ walked in obedience to God the Father. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. And no greater love have any man than this and a man lay down his life for his friends. There's the, the greatest commandment is are these there's two commandments love that the the lord thy god with all thy heart with all thy soul and with all thy might and also to love thy neighbor as thyself and especially those that are of the household of god those that are saved love the brethren this is my commandment that ye love one another as i have loved you and also john wrote in first second and third john uh much emphasis on loving the brethren and uh, you can't have a right fellowship with God and, and, and not have fellowship with the saints of God. Verse 13, greater love have no man in this than a man lay down his life for his friends. I didn't know it was right there, but it is. <laughs> Verse 14, ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. And remember, uh, Abraham was called the friend of God. Why? Because he did whatsoever God commanded him. He left Ur the Chaldees as God commanded. He went past Haran as God commanded he uh, had a child in his old age as God commanded of course he stumbled along the way and had a child out of unbelief with Hagar the Egyptian handmaid and that caused a lot of problems he took his son his only begotten son to Mount Moriah to, to worship the Lord to offer him up as a sacrifice counting that the Lord was able to raise him from the dead um, I don't necessarily believe, I was, as uh, Brother Doss was saying, that he believed that God would withdraw his hand, that he would stop him from offering up his own son. He did it in faith, knowing that if I did do this, that God will raise him from the dead. God will keep his promise. Uh, so we want to be called the friends of God, and we want a close walk and fellowship with God. In order to do this, we need to observe the word of God. We need to not turn our way, turn away our ear from hearing the law or the word of God. Uh, we need to keep short accounts in our uh, confessing of our sins. And then, and we have to love our brethren, and then our prayers will be heard. And if we don't, our prayers shall be an abomination unto him, strongly detestable. You walk in darkness and now you want me to answer your prayers. God's not going to do it. God wants you to walk right. He wants you to be upright. You know, I don't know how far we're going to go. Um, let's see. Let's look a little further here. Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit. But the upright shall have good things in possession. And we'll do that too because we're still talking about the upright, uprightness. Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, there's a lot of those, that your faith in Jesus Christ scares them, and right away they would like to 
break up that walk, break up that fellowship. They would like to get you to act like them and talk like them and, and behave like them. So that way they can write off your Jesus Christ as just a fad, just a phase in your life. And they will set up uh, traps for you, trying to cause you to fall into sin. And the Bible said, Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit. You try to cause the righteous to sin, and you're going to end up falling in your own trap. You're going to fall in your own pit. You're going to end up hurting yourself, and you're going to reap what you sow. But the upright shall have good things in possession. What things in possession? Well, the Bible speaks of somebody being poor and walking in his uprightness. He may have relatively little to no things in his possession, but what does he have? He has the knowledge of God. He has the word of God, the most valuable book in the world. He has a relationship with God the Father and the Son. That's eternal life. You say he doesn't have a life. He doesn't go to the clubs. He doesn't go to the events. He doesn't have the nice things. He doesn't race his car in the drag races. He don't uh, uh, go here or there. He doesn't, he doesn't hang out with the, with the in crowd. Yeah, but he's in with Christ. He is in Christ. He has a relationship with God the Father and God the Son. He has the most abundant life. He knows God, the Father, and the Son. That's eternal life is the Bible's description of eternal life. It's not just a period of time living forever, but it's knowing God the Father and the Son. And he has a walk with them. He's the friend of God. He has that in his possession. He has great friends in the church, saved people that would lay down their lives for for him uh, so you think he has nothing but he has many great things in possession he has a great father and a great mother that loves him and uh, he has a father that that not just wants to be the son's buddy but wants to see him hang around wise men he has a, a mother who also uh, not desires to be the friend of their son or daughter but but to see them succeed truly in life and that having a close walk with God. This is the great things in possession. He is blessed with a good local church to meet up with every Sunday and every Wednesday night. He is blessed with those that would uh, cause him to keep a close walk with God. Those that would exhort him and encourage him to get in his Bible, to stay close to God. That are the great. Those are the great things in possession. And not only that, but he has many things in possession that he has laid up in heaven and heavenly places so that when he dies and this short little vapor of life is gone he will have much laid up for him in heaven and he will uh, reap these things and benefit from these things that he did in life the choices he made in wisdom that, that, that were taught him from the word of God and from the right kind of companions he will have these things to reap and, and be benefited from for eternity whereas the person who's short-sighted, the person who lives the riotous life, the person who chases after riches, the person who wants his inheritance now, he lives and he gets all that stuff now in this life, but then it's soon gone. It takes up wings, the Bible says, that riches can take up wings and it can fly away. You could be rich today and then be poor tomorrow. You can have all the friends today and then they'll all forsake you tomorrow as soon as you lose the riches. But if you will invest your time around the right kind of people, in God, in the Word of God, walking in uprightness, God will benefit you eternally. You have great things in possession to look forward to when you die. You will have a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. And I believe this is a good spot to turn off the water. And I feel like the Lord's turning it off right now as far as this message goes. And we can get into further scriptures next time in Proverbs. This has been approved unto God. And I hope you got something out of this. I hope that you would uh, choose the wisdom of God, even if it means a more impoverished life, but it's a more blessed life, I, I promise you. I've, I've lost a lot of possessions, and I try to walk after uprightness, and I try to get in my word of God, and, and I try to live a life that's focused solely on God and not on my own financial gain, not on being popular, not on being rich, not even being... Uh, going after the in crowd in Christianity but I, I dedicate my life to God and my service to those that might even be less fortunate to me and uh, loving people loving God and loving people 
and sometimes you're going to lose your possessions. But if I could be used greatly, or uh, greatly, if I could be used more greatly by doing so, then it will all be worth it when I meet the Lord and uh, receive a full reward. <laughs> Please join me again next time, and uh, God bless.